God's grace and peace. Happy Sunday. Welcome once again to this time of worship as we join together for some spiritual reflection as we think of the goodness of God's grace, love, and truth in our lives and we continue to reflect on the healing that that offers each one of us. If you are here in the Newton area, we invite you to join us here in worship here in this sanctuary. 10 o'clock each and every Sunday, Sunday morning we meet together after a little time of fellowship. We meet back up for some Sunday school, some Bible study with our uh, beloved professor, we call him Christopher West, and the guidance that he gives us as he leads us through the Bible. This is indeed the season of Pentecost. Um, when we think of the seasons of the church, you know, there are seasons that get us ready for Easter, seasons that get us ready for uh, uh, Christmas. Pentecost is that season when we truly become the church, when we reflect on how we are being God's people in our individual lives. And it's, it's kind of ironic that we do that during the summer, but uh, it, it is indeed a joy to have you here with us today and continue to give thanks for your continued and enthusiastic support for these online endeavors. Well, let's worship together. Hear now these opening words uh, based on our Hebrew scripture passages for the day from 2 Samuel and Psalm 24. Let us come into the house of the Holy One with song and dance. We come to worship our God, the creator of heavens and the earth, the seas, the seas and the river, and all that dwells within. The Lord of the dance calls us to join in this time of celebration and joy that we might know that we are gathered in God's holy place. And we join the psalmist with songs of the glory of the God of hosts, and we seek to know God's faithfulness and wisdom. Let us enter into God's rhythm of life and follow in the ways of the word. God will bring us home where dancing and joy will never end. Will you pray with me now our prayer of the day? Holy God, we thank you for the gift of the Bible. For its psalms and poems, histories and stories, teachings and wisdom, may the Spirit who called out those ancient writings continue to call out to us today. Today we pray that our lives may reflect sacred scripture as it is filled with good news, mercy, love, grace, and salvation. Amen.
Our worship service now moves towards a time of reading and reflecting on Scripture. Typically, we read the gospel passage for today, but our lectionary gospel passage is uh, something that we've reflected on not too long ago. The parable of the mustard seed, which we read from another gospel passage. And so, we are actually turning to the back of the Bible, to the epistles, the letters that Paul and others wrote to the early Christian communities, and today's passage from uh, a, Paul, a letter that Paul wrote to a, the church in Ephesus, uh, the letter to the Ephesians, it actually fits what we've been discussing these past few weeks. We've kind of had a little sermon series thinking about the healing that Jesus offers, and we're reminded that... Uh, well, when we first think of the healing that Jesus offers, we think, of course, of the miracles, the physical healing that Jesus offers. But as we've been thinking about these past few weeks, we also know that there are other ways that Jesus offers healing to those individuals that uh, he encountered during his times of ministry. But the healing that has continue, continued to be offered to us Today, when we think of those who approach Jesus looking for healing, sometimes individuals approach Jesus one after another with some sort of problem that they had that had them frustrated, depressed, full of anxieties, and sometimes this problem led them to be isolated. And Jesus would offer a parable or words of insight that offered a peaceful resolution. We think of the parable of the prodigal son parable of the Good Samaritan, and on and on. These were parables that offered healing through peaceful insights into a troubling problem. Sometimes a group of people would come to Jesus in order for Jesus to judge the situation, to tell them which of them was right. And again, it's amazing to read that through simple yet profound stories filled with the reminders of Hebrew scripture and of God's love, a peaceful resolution was brought about that offered healing to the situation for everyone involved. Again, whether it was individuals or groups of people, Jesus offered healing to situations that appeared to be out of control, out of hope. And this healing was based on the assurances of our faith. A faith that is grounded in and backed by the sustaining and eternal love and care of God. When we are reminded of, when we allow ourselves to be surrounded with the love and care of God, when we allow that sacred love and profound truth to seep into our lives, we allow healing to happen. In those sacred moments, our anxious souls are quieted for a few moments, and we are reminded of who we are and whose we are. And that's what Paul is offering us, these reminders of the way Christ offers the healing of God's love, grace, truth, forgiveness, peace and comfort. So here now, the first 13 verses of the letter to the Ephesians. Paul, an apostle of Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. God chose us to be holy and blameless before him in love. God destined for us adoption as God's children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace he freely bestowed on us and the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, a plan 
for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And in Christ, we've also obtained an inheritance. Having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. And this is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. We give thanks for the reading and the hearing of God's word for us today. Before we go any further, let's pause for a word of prayer. Oh God, we pray that you might open our minds to your word, your truth. God, give us courage to think deeply, to make loving and courageous decisions in all the challenges and perplexities of our lives and your world. Remind us again that at the heart of all reality is you and your love revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, as I mentioned in our introduction, we need to have moments where we allow God's love and truth to surround us, to heal us, so that we can be transformed to be the people of love, people who do what God needs for us to do, people who offer solutions to problems rather than create more problems in an already troubled world. We need to create times and places for quiet times of prayerful reflection so that we can be open to the healing and transformation to be God's faithful disciples. We need to reflect on those moments and those times and create places for that to happen. But before we do that, we know that each of us in our personal individual routines needs to do a few things in order just to get things going each and every day. All of us have daily routines or rituals that become so common over the years that they become habits. And for many of us, each morning can't possibly begin until we've reached for the coffee pot and enjoyed a cup or two of coffee in the quiet before the craziness of the day begins. Even when we pull back from the world, when we have moments of vacation, we still have routines and rituals. Summer vacation has its own habits. Either we go to the same place each and every year, and for most of us locally, we know where that place is. We call it the beach. It's the whole beach that stretches from North Carolina to South Carolina, the beach. Even once we get to the beach, we have our routines. There are restaurants that we have to eat at, stores we need to go in, places we need to see. Perhaps there's that spot on the beach that we need to have that is ours, and on and on and on. But when it comes to daily routines that are almost on the insanity spectrum, athletes come the closest to being absolutely devoted to a ritual or a routine before they can do what they need to do. One of the best hitters of baseball, his name was Wade Boggs, who played in the 1980s and 90s. He noticed early in his career that when he ate chicken on the day of the game, that he had two or three hits batting there in that game. So he decided that each and every game day for one of the meals, he would definitely have chicken. All right, Wayne Gretzky, perhaps the greatest hockey player of all time, he had a routine. He had to put on his hockey uniform and pads on the exact same way before each and every game. He started at the bottom, his left leg, put the pads on first, then the right, all the way up. He had a routine for each and every uh, item of his uh, uniform and equipment. And to top it off, before he went out onto the ice, he poured baby powder on his hockey stick. I'm forgetting his name, but uh, one of the former football coaches of LSU was found 
before each and every game as he would take his place there on the sideline, that he would pull up grass from the field, put it on his mouth and eat it, that that was uh, one of his routines and rituals before the game. Anyway, we know that uh, uh, regardless of what sport it is, each player has a routine that they do. We have our own rituals as a church. Our worship services are structured basically the same each and every week with a little bit of the modification here and there. We're looking forward to this fall when we can get our Bible studies, our children's and youth group times together. They have their own rituals and rhythms and routines. And we need the structure of these times in order that we can even begin to allow ourselves to be transformed by them. And again, personally, individually, each one of us needs everyday moments in our lives for some moment to prayerfully reflect on what is going on. This can be done in silence. This can be done anywhere. Just like those athletes preparing for the big game, we need to have moments where we prepare ourselves to allow for the possibility of God to enter in, to heal our anxious minds and our souls so that we can indeed offer love, grace, and truth in all that we do. And we need to have routines and rituals that allow us to do such, that, do such things. All right, well, turning to our scripture passage, we remember that Paul was once called Saul. And in his Saul days back then, he thought the best way of living out a life of God's love and truth was to actively pursue and persecute Christians. The early Christian church, the book of Acts, records stories of Saul overseeing the stoning of Stephen and arresting the followers of Jesus around Jerusalem. When he was on his way to Damascus, probably to arrest more followers of Jesus there, Saul was overtaken by a bright light, and there was a voice that was asking him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Intriguingly, Saul was blinded by this experience, and it was not until he spoke with Ananias, a Christian in Damascus, that he regained his sight. And in this encounter, Saul's vision of the world changed, and he was transformed. His passionate persecution of early Christians became a passionate conviction that God, through Christ, was ready, ready to gather people in, to forgive, and to unite them together in God's love. Again, once a perpetuator of violence, Paul was transformed by Christ's vision of a unified world under a love for God and a love for neighbor. And this revisioning changed Paul's life and the world. Well, perhaps more than any other letter in the New Testament, the letter to the Ephesians celebrates the life of the church. And if you've ever noticed Pastor Fred Thompson talking about this letter of Ephesians, he lights up. This could be, and I'll have to ask him, I think this is his, his favorite uh, epistle in the back of the Bible, this, this letter to the Ephesians, because it celebrates the life of the church, what we are called to do as a church. It's God-given purpose, and this letter radiates Paul's spirit and missionary purpose. We know that uh, Paul was grounded to do this, that there's one body, one spirit, just as you are called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. And he even starts that, says that grace to you, peace from God, our Father and Lord, who has blessed us with goodness, grace, and forgiveness. Speaking of forgiveness, being unified, called to be together as a people of God, Billy Graham once told the story of a 
college football championship. This is one of those bowl games that was on New Year's Day, and this one had Georgia Tech playing the University of California. In that game, a player recovered a fumble. How exciting! He gathered the ball in and did not realize that as he was running towards the end zone, he was running the wrong way. He was running to the other team's end zone. And a teammate recognized what was going on, and he had to go up and actually tackle him. His own teammate tackled him there before he could score a touchdown for the other team. Well, at halftime, all the players went into the locker room, and they sat down. They all wondered what the coach would say. And the young man who recovered the fumble and was tackled by his own teammate sat by himself, put a towel over a head to shot to... to uh, cover up the fact that he was so embarrassed and was crying. When the team was ready to go back out onto the field for the second half, the coach stunned the team by announcing that every single player, all the same players who started the first half would be starting the second half, including the young man who ran the wrong way. So the players headed back out onto the field, except for the young man who would not budge and the coach called him to come, but the young man said, Coach, I can't do it. I've disgraced you. I've disgraced the University of California. I can't face that crowd again after what I've done. And the coach put his hand on the player's shoulder and said, Get up and go back in there. The game is only half over. By reminding the folks there, the Ephesians, that God's love was freely given, that they were reminded that one of the many reasons that they were a faithful community was because not only of what God did, but what they did with and for one another. People of faith, Paul reminds us, are called to live to the praise of God's glorious grace. And God wants us to live with a thankful heart and praise for all that has God has done and God is doing. All right, well, besides being people who are forgiven, redeemed, assured of God's love, after we do our rituals where we are assured of who we are and whose we are, Paul reminds us that we are to be people who are united together. Paul's message addresses the importance of being bound together to unite all things in him christ things in heaven and things on earth god's purpose for us as a church is to work to make this happen biblical scholar john dominic crossan points out that long before christians portrayed jesus on the cross long before they put icons of christ in royal gear Christ as king in robes and in royal poses. Before that was done, early Christians made images of Jesus doing ordinary things. Jesus teaching. Jesus healing. Jesus eating with those who are outcasts. Curing the sick. Feeding the multitude. Crossan argues that this is at the heart of Jesus' story. This is how Christ chose to reveal God's love. Well, when we began this series of reflecting on healing a few Sundays ago, I asked for us this summer to think about September. <laughs> it's interesting to note that by then, by September, schools will have started, our schedules will once again be full, We'll be back to doing our typical routines. Once our calendars are full and our to-do lists are a few pages long, we need to remember to seek out moments of sacred healing so that we can be transformed, so that we can do and be all that God has asked us to do and to do all these things, all these things that we're asked to do, all of our responsibilities to do it with grace, to do it with love, and to do it with peace.
with the assuredness of our faith that is grounded in the assured and answered hope of God's comfort and sustaining love. Again, we've been asking each and every Sunday, are we offering healing to a broken world? Collectively, as a family of faith, how are we going to offer, come September, sacredness and holiness, not only to one another, but also healing to those in need in our community? We'll continue to reflect on this together, collectively, here in these times of worship. And I also hope that each of you and your personal lives will reflect on the healing that we can offer individually and collectively during this time. Thanks be to God for the joys and the challenges of choosing to be a disciple of Jesus and of choosing to be among a family of faith in this time and in this place. Amen. We were choosing music, and this was one of the possibilities that we were given. An amazing grace, my chains are gone. My mom requested me to sing Amazing Grace at her funeral. And I would have, except that I had just learned this. And I thought it was more appropriate for her, for what we were celebrating. So I hope you see in it what I saw in it. chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy rains unending love amazing grace the Lord has promised good to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures my chains are gone I've been set free God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, the earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you are forever
Our worship service now moves towards a time of prayer, where we prayerfully reflect on the joys of our lives, but also the concerns that we have for our individual lives, our families, our church, our community, our nation, and all of God's created world. And again, all through this summer, as we reflect on the struggles, the issues that are going on in our lives, we prayerfully reflect on the ways that each one of us might be able to offer a little more healing, a little more peace, a little more comfort to all the struggles that is going on in our world. We also have individual concerns, and as always, I'll have a time of silence during our prayer, and I invite you to remember those cherished loved ones that you're holding close in your thoughts and your prayers today. Friends, let's come together for this time of prayer. God, we now offer our prayers to you, for you've taught us to pray not only for ourselves, but for your people everywhere. And it's in that spirit of joy for all you have done for us in Jesus Christ that we rejoice as we offer our, our praise in this time of worship. God, we thank you for your goodness through all the years of worship and witness, particularly here in this place, for your grace in calling us to be your people. And we give thanks for all who established this congregation over 175 years ago. We give thanks for all who've been members of and a part of this church family who gave of their time and talents for all of us. And we pray that we may continue to offer your peace, your grace, your truth, not only to one another, but also in ways of healing to our community and to your world. God, we bring together and lift now our joys and our concerns. We remember the loved ones who occupy our thoughts those who are in need of our prayers and we pray that God you'll comfort all who are in trouble sorrow poverty sickness grief and we remember cherished loved ones now who we name before you in these moments of silence God, we pray that you will uphold all who are in need in body or mind, not only those we know and love, but also those known only to you, that they may know the peace and the joy of your presence and your supporting care. God, this new week we pray that we might be a little more spiritually ambitious. God, may we further your kingdom of love your kingdom of peace and truth in our lives and with those around us. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, the one who taught us to pray, praying now together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
As we conclude our time together, our cover of our worship bulletin states, it's in Christ we find out who we are and what we are living for. And we hope that we give thanks for these times of worship together, but we also look for times of sacred individual moments when we can reflect on this. Not only who we are and what we're living for, but what we can do each and every day. And so as we think of athletes putting on their uniforms, may we come up with one or two little routines or rituals that we are reminded, that we are surrounded with. The peace of Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.